Excellent. Okay. Well, uh, my name is Yed Ben Hirsi. I'm a senior project officer at the Physicians for Human Rights, and we're here in New York, uh, broadcasting live for our monthly webinar. Uh, this month, we are going to talk about sexual violence and forensic science. We have two special guests, uh, Dr. Lisa Smith and Dr. Claire Gambi. They came all the way from Leicester University, uh, flew across the Atlantic and landed in New York. Um, so I'm not going to speak for a long time, I'm going to just allow them to uh, offer us a 20 minutes presentation and then we will have 40 minutes to do um, a Q&A. Those of you who are attending the webinar know uh, that they can basically ask questions and we will be happy to respond to them. The webinar is being recorded and is now available on our YouTube channel uh, along with all the other webinars. So without further ado, Dr. Lisa Smith and Dr. Clark Gambi, it's up to you. Okay, thank you. Hello, everybody. Uh, thank you very much for uh, signing in for the webinar today. Uh, also, a very special thanks to uh, Physicians for Human Rights, and in particular, uh, Zed, for uh, hosting the webinar and for inviting us to meet here during our visit in uh, New York City. Um, we're very excited to be talking to you all today uh, and to have an opportunity to tell you a little bit about the work that we're doing at the University of Leicester, uh, but also excited to learn from, from your experience um, about uh, how our research can best assist the important work that, that you folks do um, all around the world. Um, before we start, I also just want to point out that Claire and I are both work in the Department of Criminology at the University of Leicester. We're not geneticists, so this isn't going to be a very technical talk on uh, DNA technology. Uh, more, we're going to use this presentation to consider the role of DNA uh, in the criminal justice process uh, and how this technology might be made uh, more accessible to complex cases globally. Um, so we won't be getting into any technical detail, but we can, we're can. we certainly happy to provide advice where you can find that uh, to anyone who might be interested. Uh, so overall, uh, we have about 20 minutes, as Zied mentioned, to talk to you about uh, forensic uh, science and sexual violence. So we're going to start off by just giving you a bit of an introduction to ourselves and our research network, which is called the International Crime, Conflict and Crisis Research Network. Um, then we're going to talk about the role of forensic DNA uh, in sexual violence investigations and prosecutions a little bit. Uh, then we're going to mention some of the important barriers that uh, you all have probably come across in your practice uh, to accessing DNA evidence, particularly in complex uh, situations and in developing countries. Um, and then we're going to tell you about uh, a research project that we are currently working on, which is called the Evidence Kit Project. So we'll get to that at the very end. Okay, so just a little bit of background about the University of Leicester. We have uh, quite a long history of forensic science research and innovation at Leicester, um, beginning in 1984 with the gentleman on the left of that photo, uh, Professor Sir Alec Jeffries, who uh, discovered DNA fingerprinting at the time, that's what it was called, better known now as DNA profiling, um, in our genetics lab in 1984. And obviously that discovery uh, really revolutionized the way that crimes are investigated and prosecuted, um, mainly in a domestic context, so in a European and North American context largely. Um, and in particular, in cases of violent crime, it provides a highly discriminating technique uh, for identifying individuals. And since 1984, DNA has been celebrated a lot as being the gold standard in forensic evidence, um, and most people are aware of cases where DNA has played a significant role in identifying and convicting individuals. However, I also like to point out when I do talks like this that there's an often forgotten role uh, that DNA plays in the criminal justice sector, and that's its ability to exonerate innocent people um, accused of crimes. And this is an equally important contribution that DNA has made to the criminal justice sector through organizations like the Innocence Project, for instance, and we shouldn't forget this when we reflect on this important discovery. Uh, moving on a little bit at Leicester, the gentleman in the middle of that uh, photograph is uh, Dr. John Bond, who now works with us in the Department of Criminology. And uh, John has worked for years on uh, innovation recovering fingerprints from uh, difficult surfaces. So in particular, he came up with a method for identifying fingerprints from metal surfaces, and more recently, he's worked on uh, techniques to recover fingerprints from thermal paper, which is the type of paper you get from a cash register receipts. So um, John's work has been focused on, um, on developments in the fingerprint world. Uh, a little bit more recently now, moving on to 2014, uh, we host the Intrepid Forensics EU-funded doctoral training program. So this is a 3 million euro award from the European Commission to host 
uh, PhD students at the University of Leicester. So I manage this program, and we currently fund uh, 10 PhD students from around the world who are studying really interesting uh, forensic science projects. And I bring this up because you might be interested to visit the website, which is there on your screen now. Um, this, the researchers keep research blogs. So if you're interested in their findings, you can follow their blogs. And in particular, project number three, which is a researcher called Marwan al Curry, is looking at improving DNA recovery techniques from um, difficult surfaces, and in particular surfaces that are highly degraded or have been subject to environmental extremes like explosions, etc. So you may want to, to visit that website and follow his work if you're interested in that. Um, and then the final two areas I just want to mention is uh, a lot of work we have ongoing in our engineering department, which is um, looking at forensic engineering uh, as it relates to force required to inflict certain kinds of stab injuries. So Professor Sarah Hainsworth um, does a lot of research and testifies quite often in court um, on stabbing cases and also cases of dismemberment. And then we have um, in our archaeology department people interested in forensic archaeology. And in fact, one of the intrepid forensics PhD students called Jessica Lamb is doing an archaeology-based project on 3D imaging of skeletal remains. So just gives you an idea of some of the forensic science activity that's uh, happened at Leicester over the last 30 years and give you some idea of where you can find more information. Uh, more relevant, I suppose, to today, though, is uh, one of the most recent developments, which is this new uh, research network that we have formed, which is the International Crime Conflict and Crisis Research Network. So it's very new. We just got together for the first time. This is a picture from our inaugural meeting with kind of the founding members in September 2015. Um, and what we're, we have here is a group of researchers from across a range of academic disciplines who have interest in topics relating to crimes of, of a variety of types. Sexual violence is one of them. Um, but crimes as they relate to the context of conflict and crisis situations, uh, which include humanitarian and human rights related topics. Um, and one of the things we'd like to say at this stage is that we're, we're very keen to engage with practitioners, including NGOs, at every stage of the research cycle to ensure that this work that we're doing, this network, is informed by your experience um, and your needs. So in this webinar, when we get to the Q&A session, it would be great to um, have a bit of dialogue with the, the attendees. If anybody has interesting ideas or comments, we would love to hear them. And the network is organized under three main research themes that are listed there. So the forensic science theme, I'm not going to say too much about because that's going to be the rest of this, this webinar presentation. Um, but we do have emerging themes of research outside of sexual violence in the forensic science uh, research theme, including um, art, heritage, and conservation crime in the context of conflict and crisis, as well as wildlife crime. So we're looking at some forensic innovation uh, to help with crime types as, um, as well as sexual violence in other areas. I'm going to turn over to Claire to talk yeah. about the other two things. Okay, so within the investigative interviewing theme, we have researchers, we have experiences, practitioners. So the gentleman in the grey shirt, that's David Walsh. He was previously an investigator for the British military police prior to joining academia. Next to him is Professor Ray Bull. Um, he's written some seminal documents on the interviewing of children and other vulnerable witnesses and suspects. In this theme, we're particularly interested in issues relating to the use of language interpreters in victim and witness interviews and in court proceedings more broadly. And the goal of work within this category is to help support practitioners to achieve best evidence. In the victim engagement theme, we have researchers who are interested in work that supports victims throughout the investigative and trial process. We're also keen to engage in research that can help to challenge rape myths and misconceptions, which may influence prosecutors, judges, um, police officers, um, the wider public, which would ultimately contextualize why victims would not come forward um, to report sexual violence or to stay engaged with the criminal justice process. Um, another area that we're interested in is the emotion, emotional impact on investigators, including those who work with NGOs and prosecutors um, that may result from working on these complex and traumatic cases. Okay, so that's a little bit about our network. Um, before we start talking about the role of um, DNA in criminal investigations, we're going to start off with a little bit of audience participation, and I think we're using a slightly new technology here, so hopefully it works okay. Um, hopefully you'll see that in your uh, control panel we've launched a poll. Uh, the poll is also up on your screen, uh, and the question I would like you to, to take a guess at the answering is, in the UK and the USA, and I'm focusing on those two areas because this is what I have reliable statistics for, so it's sort of a domestic context if that's where you are located. In what percentage of crimes recorded by the police 
is a useful is useful DNA evidence recovered by investigators? Do you think? Do you think it's around forty percent, around one percent, around five percent, or twenty percent? So if you select your end here in a second, and then I think we'll be able to see the results. Hopefully, yeah. Right, so get your votes in if you haven't already, and we'll have a look at what you think. Right. Can they see that same box with the results for me? Yeah, okay. All right, so... So you have 80% pretty much of the people. All right, about 80% of your voters. So continue to vote if you like, but I'm just going to comment on uh, how the spread of answers is coming out here, because I think it's safe to say that uh, what I predicted is was going to happen and has happened. So the correct answer, and now if you vote after this, uh, obviously you'll get it right. <laughs> the correct answer is actually option two, approximately 1%. And that seems to be the least popular uh, choice, which is exactly what I thought would happen. Um, the actual figure is about 0.8%, uh, so it's a little less than 1%. Um, and this is interesting, this happens when I try the same question with students all over the world, really, um, that uh, we, we always grossly overestimate how useful uh, DNA is in a criminal justice context, mainly because of media obsession with DNA and forensics. Uh, so people are sometimes surprised by how, how few cases it, uh, it's actually useful in. It's a bit of a trick question, though, to be fair. So for those of you who didn't get it right, don't feel too bad, because uh, I did ask what percentage of crimes across the board, not just sexual violence, not just violent crimes, and there's a lot of variation in the role that DNA can play across different crime types. So it can be particularly useful um, in cases of violent crime, um, and in particular those crimes that are committed by perpetrators who are strangers to the victim, which is a, a relatively small percentage of all crime. And there's a large proportion of recorded crime that doesn't have a crime scene with a biological sample associated with it, so hence such a small number. But really this poll was just to, to get you to realize that if DNA is not the answer to every criminal question, and so when we come to talk about the role of DNA in prosecuting sexual violence, I just want you to keep that in mind, that it's not something that uh, answers every kind of, of criminal question. All right, thank you for that participation. <laughs> thank you. Okay, so DNA has become a common evidence type in domestic cases of violent crime, including sexual violence. And we know that DNA is most useful in cases where the victim cannot identify the perpetrator, and where it becomes a powerful tool for identification. It's also very useful for linking cases committed by the same perpetrator or perpetrators, and it provides intelligence to inform investigations. Um, this is especially true in jurisdictions where DNA databases are available. But what we know is that the vast majority of rape cases that occur in the domestic local level involve perpetrators who know each other, um, well, victims and perpetrators know each other and they know each other well, typically. And DNA is often limited in these cases. It's therefore important to remember that while DNA can provide strong corroborating evidence, often it isn't available, and it shouldn't therefore be considered necessary for a prosecution to proceed. Um, and the other thing that we wanted to point out on this slide before we move on to talk about sexual assault specifically in terms of how DNA is collected is just to comment on where innovation in forensic science has really been focused, uh, including DNA in recent years. So the focus really has been on um, developing techniques like DNA to be faster, so rapid DNA analysis is now reality and, and is much quicker than it was uh, 20 or 30 years ago. Also mobile analysis, so being able to um, analyze DNA uh, in a field situation on the go is also possible now. Um, sensitivity has increased a lot, so the size of the sample that we need to analyze DNA is now very, very tiny, tiny trace evidence amounts of it can be recovered and analyzed successfully. So sensitivity has been a focus of innovation. And improving the discrimination, so improving the certainty with which we can say that DNA came from a particular individual is a, has been another focus of innovation uh, in recent years. And I think one of the um, contributing factors to uh, including forensic science as a theme in our new research network is that I've become increasingly concerned with this domestic focus on innovation and making it fancier and quicker and digital, etc. Um, at the um, uh, without considering how we might be able to make it more accessible to nations that don't have access to this technology, um, and in much more complex situations, how can we can we tap into this technology to use it when it would be useful? And this is where some of the research on the evidence kit comes in, which I'll tell you more about in a second. So if we think about how uh, DNA is recovered typically from sexual assault medical examinations um, in a domestic context, then I would assume 
in some international contexts as well. Um, evidence collection kits uh, are, are widely available. Um, usually uh, an examination is conducted by a sexual assault nurse examiner or a trained physician. Um, and the examination takes a long time to complete, sometimes hours, with the victim, and it's very invasive for the victim. So whilst there is a lot of opportunity to collect uh, very useful evidence, um, in fact, it can be quite, uh, quite traumatic for people to have to go through such an examination. Um, and in fact, a lot of victims choose not to report their crime uh, to avoid having to be examined. But the contents of the kit include um, a number of different uh, tools to collect some of the evidence types that are listed here. So there would be packaging uh, to collect victims' clothing or bedding or any other materials that might yield uh, a useful DNA sample. There will be a comb for collection of hair, so for instance, pubic hair, which might belong to a perpetrator. Um, there will be external swabs, so DNA swabs to swab externally uh, surfaces of the body where, for instance, saliva or semen might be visible, so they can be swabbed externally. And then, of course, you also have your intimate swabs, so your vaginal and anal swabs as well, um, to collect, hopefully, perpetrator DNA uh, from intimate swabs. We might collect uh, fingernail clippings, we might do a mouth rinse, and these largely depend on the description that the victims provided of what occurred in the assault. Uh, a urine sample uh, is sometimes useful if it's um, been alleged that there's been uh, alcohol or drug facilitated sexual assault, um, as well as a blood sample, and then of course uh, a lot of paperwork to, to properly document um, injuries and file a proper report. So the design of these kits and the protocols that are associated with them require a trained medical professional to administer them um, to, and to recover any available evidence. So the question that um, I was asking a few years ago was, does this mean that there is no means to collect evidence if a medical professional is either not available, accessible, or if the victim refuses to attend the hospital? And in the UK, uh, we do have um, something called an early evidence kit. So this is an early evidence kit. Just, just, I've just taken it apart and put it on my desk to take a picture of it for you. Um, and this is the content. So these kits were developed by the UK Metropolitan Police together with Project Sapphire. Um, and in these kits, you find um, a mouthwash container, which is there on the right, so the victim can um, rinse their mouth out with some DNA-free uh, water and then spit into the, the cup. Uh, there's a urine sample module together with uh, toilet paper, which is also collected, and then external swaps. So similar to the medical kit, and this can be administered by anybody. So a police officer can administer it, uh, a support worker at a clinic. It doesn't require uh, medical training to administer this kit. And so this is a useful way to gather evidence from victims who either can't or won't uh, present at a hospital, or if that uh, hospital visit is going to be delayed for some reason, uh, you can maximize your opportunities to collect evidence with an, an early evidence kit. The downside to these kits is, of course, the one thing missing, uh, one of the things missing is the intimate swabs. So there are no um, vaginal or anal swabs. For obvious reasons, perhaps, this can be administered by anybody, so you obviously need uh, training to administer the intimate swab. And this is a, a problem for these kits because arguably the intimate swabs can be the most useful evidence um, as um, they are very strong evidence that intercourse occurred with a particular person and it's also the DNA evidence that's most likely to be retrievable up to seven days after the assault. So whilst the early evidence kits provide an opportunity for, for accessing DNA, they are missing you know, sort of the most useful swab from the medical kit. So, um, before we go on to tell you about the evidence kits that we've been developing, um, Claire's just going to comment on uh, the fact that in complex circumstances there's some much more difficult challenges to accessing evidence than we have in the domestic context. And these challenges are common to circumstances where there's been conflict or a natural disaster or crisis or displaced communities, remote locations, and etc. Yeah. So under those circumstances, it might be that um, victims are unable to access medical facilities, either because those facilities have been overwhelmed or they've been destroyed, they're too far away, or perhaps they simply don't exist. If there is medical facilities available, there may be a lack of training, a lack of technical ability or equipment to recover and store the necessary evidence. There may also be fear of reprisals in cases um, of documenting sexual violence. We also know that in times of crisis, there can be a breakdown in law and order, and therefore a lack of infrastructure or political will to respond to sexual violence. And also there may, may be a lack of trust in police authorities. There's also the issue of time lapses, and that many cases involve crimes that occurred some time ago, even though they are now being investigated. And here there is the loss of evidence. Although paternity testing may still be possible if the sexual violence resulted in pregnancy. 
So in order to overcome some of these challenges, our network is currently developing innovative ways to collect DNA evidence. All right, so this brings us on then to the Evidence Kit project, which is um, how we'll end the presentation, really. So um, one thing I want to mention before I tell you about this project is that um, it's very much an ongoing research project, so it's not, not complete. And in fact, this is the first presentation we've done uh, after receiving some preliminary results. So this really is uh, sort of hot off the press, but also a work in progress. Um, unfortunately, the other thing to mention is that I can't uh, yet show you the specifics of the kit and the design of the swab. Uh, mainly because we have an application for a patent pending, but we're more than happy to share that detail with the network um, as soon as it becomes available. But what I can tell you about this project is that we started off from these, these two main questions. One being, can we design an evidence collection kit uh, and evidence focusing mainly on DNA, which can be self-administered? So in the absence of access to a medical examination, could we uh, design a kit similar to the evidence, uh, early evidence kits that already exist, but with the new element of having a self-administered intimate DNA swab. And if we had that, would it successfully recover DNA from sperm following unprotected sexual intercourse? So that was kind of the overarching research question here. And there is a legal and medical precedent for, for this sort of a kit. Uh, I've already mentioned the early evidence kits are admissible in UK criminal justice sector. So we know that this idea of kits that aren't administered by a medical professional um, are able to stand up in court, at least in the UK. So there is a legal precedent for that. And there's a medical precedent for the use of self-examination intimate swabs um, because they are used for a number of diagnostic purposes already, um, including um, intimate swabs that can be self-administered to identify sexually transmitted infections. And there's commercially available products that are self-examination for diagnosing yeast infections and bacterial infections. So we know that there is sort of a, both a legal and a medical precedent, but to the best of our knowledge, not a DNA recovery kit that is um, self-examination based. So what we've done is we've come up with a, uh, a prototype of this kit, and we've done an initial pilot study. And these are the findings that are sort of hot off the press. There. We just uh, started analyzing the data last week. So this is quite a small scale sort of proof of concept study, really, just to test whether self-examination can, in fact, produce successful results. Um, and uh, here's the methodology we used for this pilot study. So participants were male, female couples who volunteered uh, to participate. And these couples engaged, were engaged already in consensual unprotected sex, and they agreed to do so and then use uh, one of our participant kits uh, 12 to 36 hours later. So the kits contained your usual consent forms for both the male and female participant, very detailed instructions for the female participant to use the swabs, and we're keen to make sure that these instructions can be portrayed using only pictures, so that language and, and uh, literacy is not an issue. Um, there was then buccal swabs, so a standard cheek swab um, that the male and female participants uh, used so that we had a baseline for their DNA profile uh, from that. And then there was two versions of the intimate swab um, because we were testing two different designs, so two prototype versions. Um, most couples agreed to use both, so on two separate occasions of, of intercourse they tried each of the swabs. And then the female participant also filled in a survey to comment on how easy were the instructions to follow, how uh, comfortable was the swab to use, did they experience any um, discomfort or pain or, or trouble using it. And so the preliminary results we have so far is that um, we were really pleased that in almost 90% of the swabs we had returned, we were able to get a male DNA profile. And the time since intercourse on these ranged from 12 to 34 hours. So um, 12 to 34 hours later, we were able to get uh, DNA profiles from the intimate swabs that matched the male's buccal swab. Um, one, only one kit failed to return uh, a Y-DNA profile. We don't know why this is. Uh, it could just be uh, a fluke, or it could be that it wasn't used properly. So we are further investigating that one case. But out of all of them, just one didn't come back successful. Um, the female participants who completed the survey, they found that the kits were easy to use. Um, there was about a 50-50 split uh, between who preferred which type of swab. So we're going to take that into account when we decide how to design it. Um, and uh, nobody found the kids difficult or uncomfortable or painful, so that was, that was good. So we're quite pleased that uh, we were able to demonstrate that at least the concept of a self-examination kit um, can yield successful uh, DNA results from the male profile, which is good. So the next step for this project really is, um, as I mentioned, the pilot study really demonstrates the concept is possible 12 to 34 hours after um, intercourse. We're further analyzing the swabs using an even more discriminating YSTR kit. So that may be that the one we haven't didn't get results from, we may with this more discriminating kit. Uh, we're working with a, a global 
uh, industry partner Thermo Fisher Scientific on the design and the manufacture of the intimate swab itself and we'll use the results from this and the survey to, to design something that will work well. Um, and uh, Thermo Fisher is already actively involved in, in designing and manufacturing sexual assault evidence kits so they were a good partner to work with. Um, and so we're currently preparing an application for funding um, to support uh, further research on this idea of development and consultation and of course this would greatly benefit from practitioner partners like yourself. So in the Q and A, if you have any any comments for us or questions, we would um, really appreciate that. Um, and I think that's where we'll stop because I think we've done twenty minutes, just about. Um, and so we'll move into the question and answer. I think, but uh, you have the slides as a handout attached to the webinar. So if you want our contact details, please feel free to get in touch with with us with any questions after. Excellent. Well. Thank you so much for this presentation. Uh, yeah, we're still on time, and I think we're going to open the floor to the questions. Uh, well, technical questions first. Will the presentation be available to us as a PDF? Uh, definitely, yes. There is a handout section, and uh, actually, in the webinar, uh, and you can actually download the presentation right away. Uh, I hope you're able to find it. If you're not able to find it, you can email us. Um, and then I think as you guys are writing up your questions, we may turn to the room and see if we have any questions in the room, and then we we'll go back to the questions on the webinar. Hi, I'm Sue Simon with the Francis Training Institute. Thank you very much for what was a really, really interesting uh, presentation. My question is how, what are your ideas for how victims would access these kits? Mm -hmm. Do you want me to repeat the question or do you think I picked up? Okay, so the question, in case you couldn't hear it, was um, what are our ideas for how victims might get access to the kits and days? So um, logistics is clearly going to be a difficult thing. Um, when uh, we, we met with some other practitioner groups and NGOs before this, and this very same question came up, obviously, um, and one of the things that we had discussed was the possibility of um, clinics that are already on the ground already seeing victims uh, after cases of sexual violence and in some cases documenting those cases um, could be uh, provided with the kids. That would be a great way for them to um, get out. One of the other advantages to that is that whilst there would be nothing stopping somebody from using one of these kits at home, for instance, what we are very aware of, especially those of us with a background in friends, is the need for some continuity of that evidence. So what would be ideal is if the kits are used in a, in a support clinic or medical clinic situation, so they could be supervised to a certain extent, maybe not necessarily face-to-face -face supervised, they could have privacy while they're using it, but at least it's happening in a controlled environment and then can be collected straight away by somebody who can take that ownership of it. Um, so I think the best way, in my mind, and people who are attending the webinar yourselves mm -hmm. might have suggestions that are better than this, but I think stocking clinics in high risk areas with the, the kits would be the best way for them to be accessed. Mm -hmm. yeah. Do you have any thoughts on that? Well, it's, a, it's an interesting question because I wasn't sure if you were also thinking of uh, providing them to police departments. I guess I was also thinking about what are community-based uh, Organizations or even places where, so a beauty parlor, for yeah, example. Yeah. Um, and I wasn't sure, because I think on the flip side, if people had those kits at home, then you would run into problems mm -hmm. of people saying, oh, well, they had this kit, they must have been planning to say it was sexual assault. Et cetera, et cetera. I think so, the other important thing to keep in mind, that's absolutely right, and I think actually that these kits have a very limited potential in the domestic context for that same reason, is that what you, what you need to be very careful of is that you don't uh, run into a situation where somebody's accused of stitching someone up by swabbing themselves after you know, a, a consensual uh, sex and then claiming uh, something else happened. Um, but I think where the value of these is greatest is in cases where, again, the victim and perpetrator are not known to one another, and the perpetrator is claiming complete lack of knowledge of the crime. In that case, the, the kit would be very strong evidence that, that intercourse has occurred between two particular individuals. Outside of that, again, we get back to where DNA isn't particularly useful. 
Um, and so I think we need, we would need to be careful with who the kids we use properly. So in my mind, I think places where victims would normally present, clinics, police, certainly anywhere mm -hmm. like that. And the other thing to note, and I, I think I might have forgot to say this actually, is that I certainly also wouldn't argue that these should replace a thorough medical exam. This is really just trying to think creatively about how you might get intimate swabs when that isn't accessible. But I wouldn't uh, advocate, you know, just because it's easier than going for a medical exam to do that. I'm thinking of more extreme circumstances where the alternative is not possible. Yeah. So questions yeah. are starting to pop oh, up. And uh, <laughs> the first one is from Rudo Masanzo. And he's asking actually about the exclusion criteria you are using for the self-taken intimate swap. The exclusion criteria. Uh, could we clarify what you mean by exclusion criteria? Basically in the selection, I think. Of the or, participants. Or the participants or, or in the way they do the procedure, I guess. OK, so, um, so basically, uh, so part of if I'm understanding the question properly, um, because we had, um, so part of the reason for the buccal swabs in the kit was so that we had a, um, a, a male DNA profile and the females, because of course with an intimate swab, it's gonna be a mix of DNA from the male and the female participant. So the fact that we had the male's buccal swab means that we could then go back and match the DNA from the swab back to the male partner, if that makes sense. Um, and in terms of how, um, so these were just uh, volunteers after putting out a call uh, to participate in the project. So there was really no uh, criteria for selecting or excluding participants, if that's what the question is getting at. Um, apart from, um, we were concerned about male participants who may have uh, been vasectomized because that would limit our ability to get uh, DNA from that. So we had to ask about that. And, uh, but other than that, as long as they weren't using any barrier methods of birth control, we didn't have to exclude any participants from that. But I'm not sure if that's what the question is getting at, but if not, perhaps the participant could ask another version of it, but yeah. yeah. Uh, excellent. Well, um, we're just going to move to the next question. Yeah. And um, actually, Karen Amber, our director of the Sexual Violence Program, is asking, uh, what are your plans to pilot this work outside the UK, especially in a resource constraint context? Yeah. Um, that's a very good question and part of the reason for our, our little road trip to, to the US. Um, so uh, clearly it's, it's uh, too early to, to be doing uh, pilot tests just yet uh, in a kind of field context. Um, the next stage, as I mentioned, would be to, to bid for some money to do some much larger scale kind of manufacturing and research. But once we have um, sort of a version of the kit that we're quite confident works quite well and is easy to understand and we have instructions that are will be applicable in different contexts, we would most definitely need to think of a way to, to pilot test them in lower resource uh, areas. Um, and this is part of the reason really for, for reaching out to groups like Position for Human Rights who have experience on the ground working with people um, is kind of twofold. One is to get input into how we design the kits and how we deploy the kits, uh, like the question earlier, but also how can we, we access areas to, to pilot test. So we would be very keen to, we certainly have plans to do that, and we would be very keen to discuss that with uh, people once we're at a stage where we have a product to, to test properly. Um, we, have, we have a question as well from Jocelyn Brown about chain of custody. So mm -hmm. she's saying chain of custody is a big issue in the US. How do you address that with the self administered kit? That's a very good question. Yeah. And that is uh, one of the biggest challenges of the, uh, the self-examination model. Um, and as I mentioned in response to the first question, um, I, don't, I don't know how, I, I have concerns with how useful the, this kind of a kit would be in a domestic context for the reasons that I've already said. Um, and I think this is another good argument for having the kits available in a, um, an environment where, like a clinic for instance, where you could at least provide basic awareness and training to the people working in the clinic about the kits. And the kits could be self-administered but under some amount of supervision. Um, what's a bigger issue for me is then who will take uh, possession of the kits. So this is something that we need to be engaging with people who are on the ground and working in uh, international organizations who, who work in these clinics um, mm -hmm. to figure out the logistics of the chain of these kits from the victim using them perhaps in a clinic environment through to where do they end up in a lab for testing. And I think that's, it's tricky to be honest and, I think, and chain of custody is absolutely something that we have to be certain about. So that's another reason why I think that although the kits could well be used in, say, in the privacy of someone's home, I think that realistically they need to be uh, used in an environment where the chain of custody can be followed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
need to elaborate on that. So it's a very good question, and it is something that through the wider research project we need to, you know, collaborate with the courts, with the local police, yeah. with all kinds of groups to figure out ways to overcome that. But but I think the UK's early evidence kits demonstrate that it's possible. So I think it's a tricky it's a tricky thing to work through, but I don't think it's impossible to do it, and I think it's a worthy cause to, to discuss it. Mm -hmm. So yeah, and again, if you know people do have suggestions, then we would certainly be open to kind of listening to those. Yeah. Excellent. Uh, well, then, along the same question. So, this type of collection would be available, in your opinion, to those in police departments, medical facilities with no trainings? Yeah. Um, yeah so, basically, um, you wouldn't need any medical training to, to administer the kit. I think that's the, the point. So, I, I, in my head, what would be ideal is that the, um, the clinics or the police forces that have access to the kits to give out have some basic awareness of, for instance, what are the circumstances where the kit's potentially useful and therefore who should you give the kit to, what does the kit have in it, what should you tell the, the victim to do with it, etc. But it doesn't require any in-depth um, uh, medical training. So that's kind of the barrier that it overcomes. So I think a bit of awareness training would be very useful, but there's no medical training required. Ahmed Alam is asking about the price. Oh. <laughs> right, no, this is something we're very, no, but we don't know yet because we haven't actually uh, pinpointed the exact design of the swab because the pilot study still needs to be further analyzed. Um, but we are very um, conscious that the, the price of the kit is crucial because if you are trying to deploy these obviously in a, a lower resource environment, they can't be uh, super expensive kits. So I wish I could tell you a little bit more about the design of the swab because I think this would answer the question a little bit, um, but I can't just yet. But what I can tell you is that we are very aware of, of the need to keep the, the kits as affordable as possible and we do have a design that should be very uh, affordable to, to manufacture. So we are, it doesn't have any high tech uh, elements to it so we can hopefully keep the price very low, but unfortunately I don't have an answer to that just yet. Excellent. I have Sounds another like a biology <laughs> question. Oh, gosh. Okay. Uh, can it be used in males who have undergone vasectomy? Oh, yeah. Okay. So, interestingly, um, so in our original call for participants, we had said that uh, participants had to be not using any barrier methods of birth control because clearly that would limit your ability to get DNA from an intimate swab. And we had originally said males who had had a vasectomy, we didn't want to participate because that would obviously influence whether you could use it. What we did in the end is, because it was quite hard to find participants, we did have a, a, a couple who came forward and said that the male had vasectomy, could they participate? So we let them, but we, we noted on it that the participant had vasectomy. And what we found with that kit is that whilst we didn't get a, a strong DNA profile from sperm in that kit, obviously, um, we did get a weak Y DNA profile result from that kit. So we were still able to get the male's DNA, most likely from um, skin cells, uh, shed during intercourse. So we're further analyzing that one with the more discriminating YSTR kit. So it may be the case that we can. It's not going to be as reliable in those cases with uh, males who haven't undergone the second. So, yeah. Excellent. Yeah. Uh, we have a question from uh, Tirulam, uh, and it's from the United Nations Trust Fund to End Violence Against Women. Mm -hmm. So the question is like, how effective is forensic evidence in developing countries where access to medical facilities, the expertise, technical abilities, and equipment ability, uh, availability are the basic barrier to collect reliable data. And here I think uh, some of our participants can also pitch in, those yeah. are especially mm -hmm. who are uh, present in developing countries. I can uh, disable your mic and you can speak if you want to, mm -hmm. but uh, I'll let you try to respond well, first. I was going to say we would probably be interested to, yeah. to we would probably be interested to know the answer to that um, from a kind of practitioner perspective. Yeah, I think, um, I don't think that being in a developing country diminishes the uh, effectiveness of the evidence if you can get it. So I think the main barrier, uh, as far as from talking to practitioners I've talked to so far, one of the main barriers is you just don't even have the opportunity to get it, whether that's because of a lack of medical facilities like the, um, the participant there has mentioned, or technical abilities, equipment, etc. So. What we're hopeful of, and really where this project came from, is a place where if the basic barrier is that there's no means to do an examination, how could we come up with a low-tech solution uh, to do that in environments where training is lacking and facilities are lacking? And I think this kind of project might be the first step in the right direction. 
Of course, the second question about the kits is great, we've got all these swabs, who's going to analyze them? So then you get into the issue of equipment and technical abilities and lab facilities and whatnot. Um, and I think that that is going to require a very multi-sectorial uh, collaboration between you know, forensic labs, perhaps in more developed countries who agree to take uh, and analyze the samples. Um, so I think, yeah, I've clarified it would be interesting to hear mm. from any practitioners who want to, to comment on that. Um, but I think that there's the potential for it to be effective if we can come up with creative solutions to some of the barriers. I think that's the key. Um, Low-tech creative solutions, I think, is probably the, the key, really. We have a couple of questions. Anna Hamze from Lebanon is asking, uh, what about victims with disabilities? Yeah. Did you have access to cases with mental delay? Uh, they are the most vulnerable to actual sexual violence in general. Yeah. Uh, another question was talking about um, are the kit materials visually accessible for those with poor, low, or uncorrected vision? Even symbols and photos can lack clarity, for instance, in light co if light colors are used or if there is a low contrasting color. Of course, the same applies to print, use light fonts, etc. Yeah, I think those are both uh, good questions. I think, and then actually wider questions that we get asked as well, which I may as well put out there and save somebody else having to ask them, is the issue of uh, can, will there be kits available for male victims, for children, et cetera. So I think accessibility of the kit is, uh, is obviously going to be a key thing um, and will certainly be part of the, the bigger uh, scoping project that we're, we're bidding for money to complete. So in the context of the tiny pilot we've done so far, um, those were obviously participants who were, who were just locally available and willing to do it. And we didn't have anybody there who had any accessibility issues. Um, I think one of the things we um, are keen to do is try and make the instructions within the kit as applicable to a wide, as wide a range of audience as possible. So for instance, not reliant on a particular language or literacy. So we're trying to make uh, entirely uh, pictorial instructions. So that kind of overcomes issues of language. Issues of um, you know visual uh, impairments and things also something that we need to consider. I mean I think um, trialing versions of the instructions with different audiences will certainly form a major part of the further development uh, process. Um, and uh, yeah, so that will certainly be be on our minds when we build that study. Uh, in terms of males and uh, children, which is something we get asked a lot, um, yes, I think there could be a version of the kit for male victims. We've chosen to focus on adult female victims in the first instance because they tend to form the greatest population of uh, next to children of victims. But certainly, I think if we can, if we can roll out the kit for women, we can certainly start to think about a version of the kit for children and men. So all these accessibility issues yeah, will form part of the larger project that we. Because the um, issue of instructions was something that was kind of tested, wasn't it, at the pilot stage? Um, obviously, that was just within the kind of English and Welsh context, but it was certainly perceived to be understandable and usable. And those um, kind of instructions were um, self-explanatory. So yeah, it's about testing that with different audiences to make sure that that kind of follows through in different contexts. I mean, I think the other thing that's and we're aware of this as well, that our pilot study was done in a domestic context where our participants, for instance, would be much more, have a lot more experience, for instance, using feminine hygiene products, which, you know, the swab is not a million miles away from the design of, of those types of products. And so we would be quite comfortable on the whole using those. When you move this out to a cultural context where that isn't the norm, the instructions need to be even clearer because they're, then they won't be used to that sort of thing. So, yeah, that will form part of the manufacturing process, I think, and the testing. Uh, there are so many questions. Yeah, there are a lot of questions. That's good. <laughs> so, yeah, Dina Serfi from Egypt is asking actually, what about antiretroviral drugs? Are you thinking about putting a pill to prevent HIV in the kit? Yeah, it's an interesting question. Um, actually, we had, um, when we met with some people from the UN back in October, one of the suggestions they made was perhaps pairing the kit up with one of the um, post exposure HIV kits that are already on the ground and, and given to victims of sexual violence. Um, so certainly that could be something that either, if it doesn't form part of the kit, could be paired up with kits that already uh, exist for that purpose. Um, it's sort of killing two birds with one stone, really, because you're accessing the same people, and it would be much easier if they could collect both kits from one uh, location. So yeah, certainly something to consider, yeah. Megan Griffiths is asking, how long can this type of evidence be stored by the victim? 
will the picture on the pin demonstrate how to store the evidence correctly? Yes, that's a good question. I didn't get into that in the presentation, but this is one of the challenges with this kind of uh, kit in, in certain environments is that DNA uh, to be stored prefers to be dry and frozen. And clearly that is uh, not always in a, in a lower resource context. Uh, large amounts of freezer capacity is obviously an issue. Um, so what we are testing as well with the design of the kit is um, the swab will basically, uh, if you, are we able to go back to a previous slide in the, yeah, uh, sure. is that okay? If I use this, will it? Mm -hmm. No, no, it's not doing Okay, if you, um, there was a picture. So if you can see on your screen now, hopefully the picture of the early evidence kits contents and there's the external swabs and you can see how they're been tubed on the table there, hopefully. Um, so that is basically the, the packaging for the, the, any kind of swab like this. So after using the swab, it goes back in the tube and then goes in a temper evident bag. Um, in the tube, you can build in a desiccant that will dry out the swab uh, itself. So you don't have to actively dry it, it'll dry it out itself. And there's uh, commercially available preservatives as well that we're testing, which will essentially allow you to almost indefinitely store the swabs in a humid or room temperature environment, no need for refrigeration. So we're, we're aware of those sorts of um, issues and we're, we're building that into the design of the kit. So basically they'll be able to be stored anywhere and once they're packaged back in and in the temporary bag, bag um, you can assure that they're not going to be able to be tampered with. So um, I hope that answers the question. Excellent. Well, we have a question uh, regarding external genital DNA evidence from internal genital DNA evidence. So basically, um, the current swab collection aims to differentiate between both. How will this be catered in the self-taken swabs? This is my favorite question. <laughs> it's, it's, what I, it's my favorite one, but I'm going to be really disappointing, and I wish I could show you the answer, but for the reasons I explained before, I can't show you what the swabs look like yet. But this has been designed, uh, the, the swab design takes account for this. So, all can, I can, can you explain the issue first in general to those? Yeah, so the issue is really that um, there's a, a big evidential difference between DNA taken from um, an internal vaginal swab, and particularly a high internal vaginal swab, compared to DNA taken from an external uh, swab, uh, simply because if you're trying to prove um, penetration and it, during intercourse, that is the best way to do it, is from the high vaginal swab. Um, and so the question, I think, is getting at the point of how can you assure that the victim hasn't inadvertently picked up DNA mm -hmm. externally whilst inserting the swab, which is an excellent question. Um, Again, because I can't show you pictures of the swab, it's difficult to imagine, but what I can say is that the swab is actually, um, in a way, protected when it's inserted, so it's, it doesn't actually come into any contact uh, externally. The only contact with the swab is, is inside, so that's really all I can say without being able to show you a picture. But as soon as I'm able to share the design of the swab, I can certainly pass on information. I don't know if there's an easy way to disseminate that to the people who have been part of the webinar, but if there is, I can do that in the not-too-distant future. But we have thought of that, and there is a way around it, and I can share that later. Excellent. <laughs> Kristen Chan is asking uh, actually a specific question regarding uh, the areas of conflict. Um, she would say, who would actually analyze these kits in areas mm -hmm. where there might be no infrastructure? Yeah, that is a, another very good question. Um, again, this comes down to the, the logistics, I think, of the whole chain of the kits, uh, which is something that we need to consider and something that we need to work with lots of different people in different parts of the sector um, to overcome. Um, I think there's a couple possibilities. There are organizations that do sort of pro bono analysis. So for instance, of DNA from mass graves or identification of victims. Um, those places are quite well suited for high throughput DNA analysis and you may be able to get some of them to offer services um, for certain regions. Um, so yeah, I think it's something that until we have sort of the kit to test, we haven't sorted out all of those details, but we would be very keen if anybody has thoughts on uh, the best ways forward and to link up different organizations. So this is really something where we need to get out and talk to police forces and to crime labs that even if they're not local, that could perhaps have the capacity to, to take samples from uh, conflict zones. Um, so there's no easy answer really to that one, but we are aware of the challenge. So we're um, a question from Tunisia, Ahmed Banasser is asking actually um, if you think the widespread use of such kits by non-medical community can lead to ethical um, 
issues. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure exactly what you're getting at with ethical issues. I, I assume it means like the misuse of, of the information. So one context that that can happen in is, as we mentioned earlier, uh, accusations being made by somebody uh, where the issue is really consent and you can't prove that with the kids. Um, so I think that there is the possibility for that, of course. I think that possibility exists, though, even in a medical context, because a lot of that is down to not so much how the information is collected, but how it's used. So I think that, um, yes, there is a risk of that, but I think there's a risk of that in any context of collecting evidence. So I think the key is to make sure that we, we use the evidence properly, regardless of how it's collected, if that makes sense. So, um, Another question is actually asking uh, if basically there would be a need of changing already existing laws in order mm. to ensure that we can use those yeah, cases. That's a good question. Well, we, we're not 100% sure, yeah. sure on the answer to that. Um, I, I think in some circumstances, definitely, because there will be jurisdictions that don't have, for instance, uh, any legislation to allow DNA to be collected from suspect, for instance. So clearly that will, will limit the usefulness. Um, I think that it will enable a change of thinking about how we uh, how we collect evidence, how evidence is considered admissible. Um, I think it's good that we have a legal precedent in the UK, for instance, for the, the early evidence kits that starts the conversation about does it have to be a medical professional that collects this, this evidence, or are we happy for you know kits that have been tested and are quite robust, are we happy for people to use for themselves? So yeah, I think it requires interesting conversations to be had in the legal community about yeah. how admissible the evidence would be in court and how we could ensure that it's, it's not misused. But um, again, I don't think it's impossible. I think that it's a worthy conversation to have just to make the, tech, the technology accessible to a wider percentage of the global population. So, And like you said, it's something we know that in the kind of English and Welsh context is something that they can be used, mm -hmm. so that's good precedent to build on. Another biology question, uh, maybe okay. forensic folks in the, in the group can also help. Uh, yeah. So basically the question is if a, vag if a vaginal swab is taken from a decomposed female victim after seven days of death when exhumed in a hot, humid weather, is it possible to recover male mm -hmm. DNA? Uh, okay, so let me just, sorry, I'm just reading it again. Take it from a decomposed female victim after seven... Okay, so the key question that isn't that I would have that isn't in that question is how long ago the sexual intercourse occurred. So that's the key. So I can see that mm. seven days since death, and I yeah. assume that means seven days since the attack as well, if she in fact yeah. died during the attack. Um, I mean, seven days is pushing the limit of ideal conditions for vaginal swab. So I would say that in hot, humid climate, decomposing body, you'd be very, uh, it'd be very difficult to get. Um, uh, successfully, probably not impossible, but uh, uh, difficult. I mean, what would be working to your advantage there is that because the victim is deceased, they're not um, showering and, and doing activity that would sometimes diminish your chances of getting a DNA sample, but I think it would be very tricky, mm -hmm. on it, especially in a humid climate. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if there's any uh, literature about that, but I'm happy to have a look afterwards and see if I can find anything. Another logistic question is mm -hmm. asking about if the kit can be actually shipped by common carrier. Does the kit require cooling, mm -hmm. during shipping, or anything like no, that? No, so the idea system? is no, the idea is to the kit, once the swab is packaged back up, it dries out on its own and it's got a preservative in it that preserves it in theory indefinitely. I mean, the studies that have been done with these preservatives have only taken place over a number of years, but there's no reason that it should uh, not work relatively. Yeah, indefinitely. So no, there's no special shipping requirements or storage requirements and beyond the temper of it and packaging, obviously, but not in terms of refrigeration and whatnot. And if resources are there, how quickly uh, must the kit, um, I mean, the analysis would take and how quickly it must be analyzed, actually? In theory, right? these kits can sit on a shelf for ages. So and, uh, it doesn't need to be analyzed straight away. Um, at all. So and the analysis portion, how long it takes in general? That really depends on the the technology that's available. So as I mentioned at the beginning of the presentation, you know, rapid DNA analysis is a reality now, which can do it in you know hours, uh, but that's very expensive. So you wouldn't require that kind of turnaround time. You could have much less sophisticated technology because it's a very straightforward sample uh, in most cases. Uh, so it really just depends on what's available locally, how long it would take, um, 
and then factoring in you know backlogs and how busy the lab is and whatnot. So it really depends. An uh, interesting comment from uh, Rudo Musanzo is saying that in a limited resource setting, basically uh, accessing medical support usually in terms of like HIV testing, STI mm -hmm. uh, screening, etc., is more important than the DNA analysis mm -hmm. in terms of allocation of funds. He's saying also the tendency of lay presentation to healthcare facility for a variety of reasons makes it even more complicated to do the collection of DNA. Uh, actually, Kate Silica is saying also thank you for an informative webinar. Uh, we could, uh, we will use some of your information, to, uh, and he will relay that to his Zimbabwe colleagues, where rape is often used as a tool to scare opponents, mm -hmm. and police often are not trained or also unwilling to investigate cases, especially within a political context. Mm -hmm. um, the other question uh, coming from Carol Lee uh, Heilwick, she actually is asking how would blood samples be collected, if at all? Yeah. Fine motor <laughs> skills uh, are critical, for instance, diabetic kids. Mm -hmm. uh, obviously, storage issue apply to. Yeah. Um, so we wouldn't, similar to the uh, early evidence kit that's still up on the screen, I think, for most people there in the slides, um, this self-examination kit would not we're not envisaging that, including a blood uh, sample module, for the very reasons that that person's mentioned. Um, it does require, you know, either a medical professional to obtain blood, or, like you say, quite uh, a skilled person to do it. So we're not imagining the self-examination kits would include that. I mean, we would be open to the suggestion of it if there was some way to, um, you know, like for instance, perhaps a diabetic type. Kit, but I think it'd be trickier. The the um, intimate swabs are actually quite easy to administer, difficult to do wrong the way that we've designed them. Hmm. Um, whereas a blood sample is much more complex, so we we hadn't envisaged including that. Actually, Ken is actually uh, yeah. Ken Hills was asking about that. In theory, untrained people could seal the kit yeah. uh, and use it following the instructions. But do you have like did you study how many people would actually successfully do that? Um, so, with success, so untrained people can still get the chain of Um Yeah, I mean, um, you, I don't believe that you need very extensive training just to seal the kit. I mean, the the temper evident bag that's in the picture there on your screen is essentially what the tube would go into. So it is literally just a case of removing the adhesive strip and closing it. Um, so I think that with some basic instructions, that's relatively straightforward to do. I mean, I understand the question. Chain of custody issues are, are going to be one of the most difficult ones to get through. Yeah. Again, I don't think it's impossible. I think it's worthy of conversation, but I think that that is going to be part of the bigger project is going to be consultation process with how we can work through logistical issues, chain of custody issues, and admissibility issues. I think they're the key. I think uh, Andrea Ward Wiley has a, has a point, though. She says that uh, Labs now do chain of custody for drug testing for employers. Yeah. The person provides a urine sample behind closed door and then give the sample to the lab employee. That's so a there great is example. a precedent. Yeah, yeah, it's a great example. And I think you could do something similar. Like you, I think that privacy while you're using the kit is a great thing from just a cultural and a, a, a traumatic uh, point of view. But again, you could do it behind a closed door in a clinic. So there's at least somebody there that knows you did it by yourself and there was no tampering by third party or whatever. Um, so that's a great example of a drug. Mm -hmm. example. Karen is asking, DNA evidence is useful when you have a match, mm -hmm. but how do you anticipate this kit uh, can be used in complex cases like gang rape mm -hmm. or conflict-related sexual violence when the perpetrators are not known? Yeah, uh, okay, so uh, that's absolutely right. Obviously, the, the greatest power of DNA is when you have a suspect to compare it to, and then it either does or doesn't uh, match them. Um, there's two interesting points to that question. The gang rate question is interesting because that adds a complexity to the analysis of the swab because you then have multiple male uh, DNA profiles on the same swab. Not impossible to analyze, but much more complex to analyze. So that is something that the lab analyzing it would need to uh, be aware of. And this is another reason why the victim statement is crucial because you kind of it would help the lab immensely to know that that's the situation before they then go to analyze that swab. Um, in terms of uh, cases where you don't have a suspect uh, to compare to, um, in those cases, I think the, the value of DNA is in intelligence gathering. So this idea that, for instance, if you could build a database based on these swabs, 
you would be start to get a picture of, for instance, the prolific nature of certain offenders. Um, you would be able to easily see cases that are linked together to the same offender. And even if you don't have that perpetrator in custody, you suddenly realize, you know, the the patterns and, and the fact that the, the prolific nature of, of some of the crimes. Um, obviously, if you get a suspect in custody someday, great. And if not, it really does just start to build a picture of um, um, of, of the scope and the, the um, scale of what's going on. So it can be used for more intelligence than evidence. I don't know if you want to say more about yeah, no, intelligence. I think, I think yeah. Stefan is adding another yeah. layer to the discussion. Another layer of complexity. <laughs> uh, yeah. By saying, actually, the issue is not an issue of training. Yeah. He's saying the issue is an issue of credibility because you're asking a victim to collect the evidence for their like uh, of their own crime scene. Mm -hmm. So basically, the whole purpose of having someone else other than the victim collect the evidence is that it's done in an unbiased observer by an unbiased observer. Um, basically, that's a, the hurdle that needs to be overcome yeah. for this. Mm -hmm. kind of he say you can see how such a self-collection kit can be abused by planting evidence. Yeah, um, yeah, no, that's absolutely true. Um, I mean, um, again, it goes back to the point of when would these kits actually be, be useful, not in cases where um, somebody is accusing someone that they know and therefore could plant uh, evidence uh, of. Um, I think they're most useful in cases where the perpetrator is not known to the victim and is arguing no awareness of the crime that's being alleged. Um, and in that case, an, an intimate swab would be quite powerful evidence. Again, I think this goes back to the point of why, although I think the kits would work perfectly fine in the privacy of someone's home, I think it would be better to control the surroundings as much as possible and do it at a clinic or at a police station or something, where again, you could go behind a closed door, uh, use the kit, come out, hand it to somebody who's trained and knows what to do with it. Um, I think that's the ideal situation um, to try and overcome some of these um, issues. But they're all perfectly valid and great points, so there's no easy answer here, right. unfortunately. <laughs> but um, we are, yeah. Um, Rudo Masanzo is asking if you have uh, taken a look at um, a pilot that happened in, Aust in Australia with initial positive results. It's called the self taken swab. <laughs> Uh, they were using this for victims in remote areas that have no access to forensic examination at the time. And I think this was like a wipe more than a swab, was it? Am I right? I'll be think. interested to hear what yeah, he says. Um, yeah, I think um, if it's the one that I know of, I think it was like a... So again, more of a, an external intimate swab rather than an internal intimate swab. But if, if he's referring to a different one, I'd love to... Uh, if there's a reference or something that could be shared, that would be great. Um, so yeah, thank you for that. Uh, Donna is asking, could you eventually have a swab that the female can blindly swab internal vagina, vagina side? Um, what do we mean by blindly? Like, is this... That's... Uh, swab? I think that's the whole... That's how it happens, I think. Yeah. Blindly. Yeah, I'm not quite sure. Um, I understand the question. That's interesting. Yeah. Anyway, we might follow up on that. Anyway. Yeah, if there's more detail, that would be good, yeah. Um, so, so basically, the last question, and here it's coming from Bonita Ivan. Um, so a bit aside of DNA, do you have or have you developed guidelines on counseling someone who is for, fearful of people? Because that might go along the kit itself. Yeah, right? yeah, I mean, that's not those guidelines we haven't. That's absolutely something that we would be interested in, in doing, kind of, and re absolutely recognizing the complexities of reporting, the issues of trust, um, and similar. So, not something we've done, but yeah, I think that would be. That would be something we yeah. explore. I think we have some clarity on the yeah. blind swab. And so, to answer that question, so you're talking about a blind swab as in no speculative exam, and that is exactly what the swab we're designing is. So, it is in terms of your terminology, a blind swab, so there's no speculum involved. Uh, with the, the kit that we're developing. So that is exactly the premise of it. Again, I wish I could show you pictures of it, um, but we'll certainly send along more details once we have permission from the university to share the, the actual design. I think that will answer a lot of the questions about uh, the design and how it looks. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, Bonita has a, a follow-up question. She's mm -hmm. asking,
that test comes from a traumatized person and knowledge that torture survivors' privacy is very protected with no records kept at treatment centers. Also, can someone test and submit with name? Oh, uh, withheld or protected? Mm -hmm. um, so basically. Yeah, I mean, well, this kind of goes back to the usefulness of it as an intelligence tool. So you could certainly have anonymous, uh, if you were databasing the, the, uh, uh, the results from the kit and using that information as more of a, an intelligence tool to build up a picture of what's going on, you could certainly have anonymous, uh, anonymous samples. It'd be difficult then if they're anonymous to tie that back as evidence in a court proceeding someday because they would be anonymous. But if you were just trying to use it from an intelligence point of view, then, then yeah, there's no reason why you, you couldn't do that. Excellent. Well, uh, thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Vina, who wrote the last comment from India. Uh, well, we're really happy that uh, the, we had you here in the office for this webinar. Uh, please feel free to reach out directly uh, to our presenters if you have any follow-up questions. We're definitely going to stay in touch with them uh, and see where this kit is going to go and uh, potential also implementation in limited resource settings or also in conflict-affected areas. Uh, but thank you everyone for attending. Those who weren't able to attend or those who want to see this again, we're going to be able to see it on our YouTube channel. Uh, but also they will receive a follow-up email um, inviting them to see it on uh, the GoToWebinar platform. Uh, we look forward to having you all for our next webinar, and thank you everyone for attending. Thank you. Bye. Bye. <laughs>